Well, good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to say a thank you to the journalists in the room for your patience and professionalism. You inform Minnesotans, we acknowledge the frustrations you've been feeling. We can do better as Minnesotans. We'll continue to. This team is committed, and we're here together, which I think uh, you're going to hear and see is the Minnesota way of doing things. At my State of the State address, I said we were going to try and find a different way to do this for Minnesota, that we were going to write our own story. And that's exactly what we did. Instead of dysfunction and shutdowns and yelling, we have compromise agreements. And as we said, coming out, we're still friends. We're here to announce an agreement has been reached on a two-year state budget for Minnesota. I'm going to clap. <laughs> I'm going to clap. This is a budget that invests in education, health care, and community prosperity in a fiscally responsible manner. Today, we prove that divided government can work for the betterment of the people we serve. As one of only two divided state governments in the country, we reached a bipartisan agreement on time for the first time in over a decade. That happened because of all of the hard work of the legislators, some of whom are here, the staff that worked together, the advocates, and the people of Minnesota. They sent us all a strong message. Fight hard for the things we believe in, but view compromise and moving Minnesota forward as a top priority. Do so with dignity and do so with honor as you reach this and try and get your work done on time. That wouldn't have happened without the leadership of Senator Paul Gazelka. Paul, for your leadership and your advocacy for the causes you hold dear, uh, for sticking up for not just your caucus, but for all Minnesotans, um, you helped us get this done. And I have to tell you, there were times during these negotiations, as you could expect, that become very, very difficult. And in those times, each of us asked, and I asked Paul a couple of times, I said, please listen to me. And a very, very rare trait, he listened um, deeply and tried to understand what was on my heart and where we were coming from. Uh, in a negotiation, there's numbers, there's lots of things happening, but it is truly about relationships, trust, and building for a common good. Um, so Senator Gazelka, uh, thank you on behalf of Minnesotans. Thank you for doing that. Um, and personally, as a friend, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. Um, and then there's Speaker Hortman, who I have to give the dearest thanks. Um, a true partner in this, again, an advocate as the Speaker of the House, certainly advocating for her caucus, but advocating for the unique People's House, where many of these discussions are taken uh, and the battles are waged over this way, the direction that Minnesota is going to go. And I will have to tell you in these negotiations, when it got tough and it looked like it wasn't going to happen, it was Speaker Hortman's dog determination to drag us back to that table, to continue to try to find a way to do that. Um, and when it comes down to it, leadership is about setting that purpose direction and then motivating us to get that done. Uh, that is exactly what Speaker Hortman did. With that, Speaker Hortman. Well, I'm very proud that we were able to work together to get this deal accomplished. Uh, you know, the House CFL came in committed to building a Minnesota that works better for all of us. And I'm really proud to say that in the budget deal that we agreed to, we have very strong funding for education, both at the education, the elementary school through 12th grade level, and also at the higher education uh, level, uh, an area I fought particularly hard for. We made a good faith effort with earlier deadlines and pushing as much as we could earlier into the month of May, doing our work in April on the floors of the House and the Senate. And I, with regard to the transparency, I can't change the culture of the legislature single-handedly or overnight. And that is a process to change the culture. But what you will see is there's three leaders here who have devolved a lot of power out of the negotiating room and into the hands of the commissioners and the chairs of the committee. And those conversations are happening in public, in conference committees. We agreed to a budget deal. We are leaving it to the leadership of all of the members of the legislature and the commissioners of the state of Minnesota to work out the agreements in public with the input of the public um, to, to even further enrich this deal that's in the best interest of Minnesotans. And so significant that we finish this work on time. Minnesotans expect a government that works. They expect leaders that will work literally around the clock to make sure that the state stays working for them. And I am very proud that we three were able to uh, achieve this really 
um, strong and fair budget agreement and to do it on time. Well, uh, I'm glad we're here saying that we got it done. Uh, both sides, uh, when you have divided government, want to win. Uh, both sides don't want to lose. And sometimes instead of win or lose, it's a draw. And that's what we had here today. It was a draw. And it was, it was good for Minnesota. Uh, we knew that we had to focus on making sure we took care of the fundamentals. And that got done. We, like they mentioned, uh, there is uh, ample funding for education, both higher ed and E12. Uh, we all looked at Health and Human Services and said, how can we deliver the, the resources that we have in the best, best of our ability to the people that needed it? All of us agreed on that. And that was true of every one of the budget areas. We looked at it sometimes from a different lens. Sometimes we pushed each other. Uh, but in the end, I think we found that place in the middle uh, which you have to find in divided government. And for whatever reason, Minnesota regularly picks this, but I've got to tell you, it's extremely difficult to get done when you actually have to do it. And first of all, for Speaker Hortman, she earned her stripes. Uh, she uh, definitely rose to the occasion. She had some vision about how we could do things different, and those things actually made a big difference in helping us get to the end. Uh, she was professional and honorable. And same thing with Governor Walz. Uh, yes, he's been in Washington, but now he's in Minnesota. And we were mostly Minnesota nice, mostly. Uh, but honestly, when we disagreed with passion, uh, it was still professional. Uh, we sometimes took a break, took a step back. Uh, but as you found out uh, in the media, we, we never really uh, said anything that we would have regretted because, frankly, we worked pretty well together when you consider that we were so far apart. And so uh, my hat's off to both the... Uh, the governor and the speaker uh, for the work that I think we did. And so it was a draw, but uh, the things that needed to get done are done for us. Uh, you know, one of the highlights of what we were really uh, trying to accomplish was that middle class tax cut. First time in, I believe, two decades that we've actually lowered an income tax rate. And it was the, the rate just above, the, not the lowest rate, but the next one up we lowered, which should Im impact a lot of people. A lot more things that got done, but that's the highlight I want to focus on today. Well, again, as you see, um, we continue, and I thank my pledge to all of you in this room and to Minnesotans, the folks up here, to continue to make uh, government responsive. We know there's more to be done, but I'll have to tell you, uh, there was a lot of listening went on and, and true compromise. I, I think Minnesota, again, rose to an occasion of where we want it to be. Uh, there's a lot to like in here. There's a lot of compromise that we made, but I think the people of Minnesota will be served well. And with that... Finally, we're ready for questions. <laughs> yes, next, Governor. Yeah, well, I made no bones about it. I don't think there's any disagreement that uh, we want to all find a way to get infrastructure fixed. We couldn't come to agreement where that was. And, and look, I'm a, I'm a school teacher from Mankato. I'll, I'm going to focus on what those investments, education you saw in here, health care, some of the other things. And uh, we'll come back at that from another angle. That what was does all that mean? Zero gas tax increase? Yes, we went down and there, there will be uh, no gas tax this year. I, I certainly, uh, you're going to get this, I think, in your inbox, all the details of this. Um, that was a part that... Uh, it was part of the negotiations. We'll come back at it. I don't think the, the need is going to change, but we'll come back and take some time to figure out a different approach to that. Health care provider tax, what happens with that? Yeah, the provider tax, uh, the sunset is gone, and the provider tax will be 1.8 uh, from now on. And again, that is a uh, part of the compromise, part of what we did. We, we, we tried to meet on some of these things, and, and I think, again, it, it prioritizing uh, the health and human services, trying to find the savings center Gazelka talked about, trying to get better efficiencies, but one of the things I think, in, instead of having dueling press conferences and, and acrimony in this, we all agree we need to take care of Minnesotans. We need to try and figure this out. And I think that that agreement of, of lifting the sunset um, was the way to go. And I would like to pay a, a compliment to Senator Gazelka there because, you know, it, it's a very hard thing to do, uh, something that you don't want to do. And to put the interests of Minnesotans and the health care of Minnesotans uh, above political ideology. We really worked hard and we're gonna do some innovative new things. The governor, I think, and Senator Gazelka are capable of the, the being the state's people who lead us forward on bending the cost curve in healthcare. We have a really expensive future in healthcare. And so I think this was uh, an area where Senator Gazelka des deserves a lot of credit for rising to the occasion and being a leader, even though it was very difficult. You're asking, so, you're asking your committees to... How does to, that affect um, the uh, One Care plan? And, Governor, if you would comment on that as well. 
Well, a, a couple of things. Uh, it's, that would be the area that we have a draw. Uh, where we uh, aligned is we know that we have to drive down the cost of health care and so there's a number of things that I think will end up in the health and human services bill that will do that whether it was one care or the route we're going now. But we put it out in the report too but we compromised on reinsurance. Um, we wanted three years. Uh, their plan was to go away. We settled uh, two years uh, because we reached out to the hospitals and the providers and that's where they felt like it should be. I agree with Senator Look, I think one of the things is is that what you see is you sometimes get competing visions. We laid out a vision where we wanted Minnesota to go to, um, but with an understanding we have things that we need to take care of, things we need to move, things that we need to go, uh, that, that can wait, if you will. And I think this healthcare piece, there's an agreement of working together to find that, to not draw, uh, you know, the, the, the total removal of, of the provider tax uh, we felt would have put too many people at risk. Um, and, and we weren't ready at this point in time to say what's coming next, that we're going to try and work on it together. And I, I agree, I think the speaker and the leader have said so. Uh, these are compromises that work. The good news that I'm gonna say today is, is that the health care that is delivered by that, that 1.1 million Minnesotans and 43% of our children are not at risk of the, the sunset of the provider tax, and, and that's a good thing. When will there be a special session? When, when will that happen? Uh, so I would suspect that if we're going to, uh, the, the special session will likely be on Thursday. We have talked just a little bit about that. We are um, asking all of our chairs to wrap up their conference committees by the time we adjourn the regular session. We've also said we will take conference committee reports as they're completed. So we want people to have an incentive to turn in their homework early. But um, I would suspect that we can get uh, a special session completed in one day on Thursday if everybody agrees and, and everybody's schedules work out. Where are we on policy? Where, anything on policy like uh, immigrant driver's licenses, restoring felon voter rights, uh, comprehensive sex ed, those things? Yeah. Well, first of all, this was budget discussion, and I think one of the things that helped us get done is that these policy discussions were not, were not a part of these. They are they're important. I, I have advocated for driver's licenses since 2005 as a member of Congress. These committees, and I think maybe the, the leader and the speaker can talk about that, these are some of the things that need to be continued to be worked out. But I think to, to get this done and get a budget deal done, we move forward on that and set the targets. Uh, uh, both Speaker Hartman and I, and I think the governor agreed, that uh, we really wanted the chairs and the committees and the commissioners all to have a much bigger role in how these things happen. Uh, they're going to have some of the same things that we went through, win, lose, or draw, where a number of things are going to be a draw. But we want them engaged, and if they can convince each other, then we're going to let them go forward. Well, you're saying, so policy and financial provisions included must be agreed to by you three. How does that happen? So you're going to have a, each of the conference committees come into you, make their case, and get a vote? This is just a statement of reality of the way a bill becomes a law. It's a little schoolhouse rock. I mean, the governor literally has veto authority. Um, but Senator Gazelka does not need to uh, bring a bill up in his chamber that he doesn't agree with, and I do not need to lift a bill up off the dais that I don't agree with. So what we expect is that there will be very few disputes that come back to this level, but uh, the House of Representatives is not going to be passing any bills uh, to, to the governor's desk that he doesn't want to sign, and uh, the only bills that will pass both chambers will be okay with Senator Gazelka and okay with me. Right, but there's hundreds of pieces of disagreement in those 10 bills. That how does that? Democracy is messy here. That's why we have so many chairs and commissioners. So how long will the special session be? Well, I think you're, you're asking about the special session, but, but your question really gets at the work that's going to be done in committees. I think you can expect that later this evening, conference committees will reconvene. And the aggressive conference committees will go until 1 this morning. Some might have some work groups that meet even in public after 1 a.m. to continue discussions and then start moving language again at 7 a.m. tomorrow. But I think you'll see a breakneck pace of work being done and as much of it in the open conference committees as possible. So you know, I just like to clarify. I'm going to count this as on time as a football coach. This is just an <laughs> overtime period. That's all this last one is to get it finished. So we are on time. Yep. Senator Gazelka, do the spark plug tax, I mean the auto parts dedicated to roads? Yeah, for now, that's where we're at for now. Um, I, what I will tell you is that all sides believe that roads and bridges is very important. We want to make sure that we're focusing on that. And if there's things going forward uh, that we need to look at, we will. Uh, I think the big thing in transportation to, to highlight that was a big, big deal is we got together and looked at how do we fix Minlars. That was the governor taking a different look. Uh, how do we 
consider a, a, a third party taking a look at it and helping us get to a different decision or complete the course we're on. That was a different step. And so I think you'll see that through, edu um, I'm sorry, through transportation, but also health and human services. We agreed on a, a blue ribbon panel uh, that's gonna take a look at health and human services uh, issues. Is there some place that we can have more savings or deliver care better? And so there's new things happening that I haven't seen since my time here. Elder, is there any bonding for transportation in this agreement? Uh, I'll leave this to them, but we, we have bonding um, that was part of this. Of course, we're carrying the debt service on the bonding, but again, I think as the speaker said and, and the leader said, there is a lot of this work has gone out to the committees. Uh, they'll be working on it. Uh, we set a target, I believe, of 500 million in bonding. Um, with 60 of that, uh, I see, uh, I see uh, Minority Leader Doubt back there, so you can help us get this thing through there, uh, Leader. Uh, we have a bonding proposal that's gonna have to go back. It's gonna have to be heard. The, propo <laughs> the proposals are gonna be heard, but it, but it is in there. Uh, it's important, and uh, I think it shows you kind of the, the broad universal agreement that came here and a lot of the issues that were tackled, but that is in there, and of course there is, uh, there is 60 million of, of critical uh, housing bonding, housing infrastructure bonding. So what, Gisella, what is the overall budget target? Is, is there a, a number? I'm trying to go through the document here. Do you know what that is offhand? It, it's kind of funny because we wrapped it up and it's been breakneck since, and I haven't actually seen the actual number. I was waiting for my team, even when I presented it to my caucus. I know it's a little bit over $48 billion, but I don't think it's much over that. What percentage would that be? I know you were shooting for uh, something. We were looking at, over a two-year period, right around 6% six point something or three something a year. Um, but I don't hold me to that because I didn't see the final, final, final number. Yeah, I'll tell you the tax bill number though. That, uh, we, we, we all thought that conformity was important, so we did that. Uh, we agreed that it would be a zero target tax bill. So we're gonna take money in, but then it goes out in tax relief and other uh, things. You know, so basically, that I mentioned the uh, middle class tax uh, bracket cut. There's a lot more, but that has to be worked out between the chairs and their committees. So you're also taking about $500 million out of the reserve. Is that a sign of confidence in this last tax month, or is it a last resort that you needed $500 well, million from you know, somewhere? Um, we made the case to the governor that uh, because the bills were the, the omnibus prime, whoever named it out there, uh, got vetoed. Uh, there was a, a number of resources that then, when we got to November, were, were scooped back up into reserves. They took a total of $491 million in November and put it into reserves, and so now we're at $2.3 or $4 or $5 billion of cash, cash and reserve accounts. So we just said we think that we should be able to use that number, uh, but we're not going to use it until the next two-year bi two biennium. Uh, and the other thing we highlighted is that we already have over $500 million of money that's forecasted that's already been shown as coming in since we set the budget, so we feel like we're in a fiscally responsible place. I just like, and I, I think that's right, and, and I just want to, when you really see divided government working, uh, we don't take lightly the use of the reserves, because I think Minnesota's credit rating is dependent on this. I think building up a rainy day fund is something we all agree with. I do think there was a reality that Senator Gazelka made a good point that we didn't dispute, that the state was doing well, the investments we made, which I think are in education and some of the things we're doing, were starting to pay back off. And we were seeing a state where the economy was thriving, those things were working, and we did have a surplus. And we did have uh, a rainy day fund that was healthy, and we came to a compromise about using a portion of those to move forward. I think that is a, a, a compromise that worked. I think it was a, a strong argument. I think we argued that we didn't want to dip that below $2 billion and continue to grow it. And there is an opportunity, as he said, if the forecast holds true and those numbers come in the final November realization, that's a good thing. We keep moving forward. We can't count on it always being there, so we need to be prudent. But it did make sense in this case, and I, I, I'm comfortable with um, where our fiscal stability is at. Uh, I am comfortable that our AAA rating is secure and we're able to do. We are way under our bonding level of where we could be. So our, our fundamentals are solid. Uh, the indicators on the economy, at least in the, in the near term, are there. And we're ready for anything as it starts to turn. Did well, you see? One, one more question and the governor will have more availability tomorrow. To what degree is this an agreement between you three and who else was involved in, in the end? Who else was involved in this agreement? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. another thing that I think was an improvement uh, over prior years is we had nonpartisan <coughs> fiscal staff with us the whole time. So we were talking about real numbers and things that actually pan out, not just ideas that sound good, uh, but things that, that actually balance. And that's why I think it's a very responsible budget. So th those were the people who made the most difference in the room at all times. Really an incredible debt of gratitude, I think, from all of us to uh, Minnesota Management and Budget and their incredibly professional staff who worked very hard on very little sleep to make sure that what we were agreeing to worked um, with the resources that we have available at the state. Did you, did you settle the opioid fee question? My understanding is that that conference committee is closing up. Well, what, is, what does the agreement say? You would have to ask Liz Olson and Julie Rosen about that. <laughs> Hava? Madam Speaker. I'm gonna, let's take a couple more. I, I feel so what about Hava? Uh, the, the majority leader has given his word that Hava would be done by the end of the session, and I take him at his word. Madam Speaker, if some of the conference committees uh, get their work done ahead of time, turn in their assignments ahead of time, are those bills going to be passed in regular session or are you going to wait till, till a special for those? I would like to get as much done in the regular session as we absolutely can. After the last week, I feel like we should take one or two more and not cut it off. Why do you have to do this in secret? Well, I would have. Yeah, go you, ahead. You go ahead. We talked on this. So a lot of it was public. Um, there are there are things that you just take risk on. You try to figure out what if, what if we did this or that, and sometimes that's, those kind of questions are more difficult if uh, you've got all of the media when you're trying to talk about that. Um, but that's part of the reason we, we wanted the, the conference committees to be open, all the policies being discussed openly, but trying to figure out the numbers is a little bit tougher. And uh, Brian Bax, uh, sorry I kicked you out of the hallway there. I was, it was all that part of trying to get done in the end, but. Uh, that's one of the reasons, I think. And I just say, I think it's a very valid question, and I think it's one that you see a group of folks that are committed to this. My time in Congress, some of the things I was most proud of were some of those ethics reforms and those transparency things, Sunlight Foundation things we did on uh, Stock Act and insider trading and those types of things. One of the things I can say is we tried and we started out early, the dueling press conferences become very difficult because to get a deal done, You've got to look people in the eye and have trust and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to float this to see if there's a way to get here. Those are the types of things that can derail because there's a lot of folks that have interest in this. And, and I think we're still struggling. Democracy is in action. You see that it doesn't work in D.C. Most places can't get it done. We did something here that in 2019 is a big deal. Divided government with vastly different visions and vastly different budgets that came together in a manner that was respectful, that took in those. And, and again, I agree that the process piece of this, that there's things we need to look at. The product, we're really proud of. There was a lot of interaction back to these chairs. Um, but, but I, too, am concerned of how we, how we think about it better. I think, again, for the first time, this is my 120th day um, or whatever in this job, that I think this commitment to doing it, and these are steps forward. I, I, I appreciate Senator Gazelka staying. That work on Minlars was a real leap of faith on all sides, on a very frustrating situation for all of us. That little bit of build helped us in some of these things say, you have my word to make this happen. Some of those things take it where if that is in a dueling press conference mode, it disintegrates very, very quickly. So I, I, we hear you. Um, I think there's more to be done. Again, yeah, we'll have more availability tomorrow. Actual last question. All right, that's it. Thanks, <laughs> Thanks folks.